Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Latino conference. Um, I'm really glad that you're joining us today. So this is for us a day of celebration. So no matter um, how bad is the work we did, we're celebrating because we did it. And um, we hope that you enjoyed the conference and also we hope that you enjoy everything that we're going to release today and which I will tell you about later on today, not only our final report, but three data sets which are going to be available um, online. Um, and um, first thing I want to say, I just want to be really brief. I just to warmly welcome you and thank you for being here. I will have more chances to talk throughout um, the next session and tomorrow. Um, and also to thank all our wonderful panelists that are happy to be part of this moment and celebrate with us. Um, and now I'm going to um, give the digital floor to our director, Bernard Bessels, who will also welcome you from the VCB. And I also have to say just one more second, um, how um, happy we are that we could um, do this project in an institution like the, the Berlin Social Science Center, where we had totally freedom of research, not only um, to do this project, but also to hold this conference in three languages. Um, and uh, so the Latino is uh, the result of a lot of support from this institution and also from the Open Society Foundation. And uh, I think that now today it's really important um, to highlight how important it is um, to have freedom to do the research we want to do. Um, so thank you, everyone. I already spoke too much for the moment. So please, um, um, Bernard, uh, our director. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I will be brief too, dear colleagues, dear all. It is really a pleasure and an honor to introduce to this uh, conference, the Latino conference, and in the name of the Social Science Research Center and in the name of our research department, Democracy and Democratization. I must say, as a director, uh, I'm proud about Tami, her team, and what they produce. It is a tremendous work they did, and it is really a new, unique endeavor. It is not only analytically uh, very worthy, because there are clear definitions of what one has to look at uh, uh, if one wants to study uh, uh, the quality of democracy means and ends. And it is also empirical. And you will hear more about it, but and to just cover 18 countries over a period of 30 years with what they did in terms of democratic innovations is just is, is great. You will hear more about it. What I can say maybe that is all done within half a decade. So that's very for a vehicle work like that. The conclusion is that anything I have learned from the project, it is that European democracies can learn from Latin America. You will hopefully see what I mean attending the conference. I wish you a nice conference, good discussions, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bernhard. Welcome, everybody. My name is Lisa Ross. I'm a fellow to the Latino Project. We're moderating today's roundtable, but before we move on to that part of the conference, we have the honor to have with us today Mark Warren, who will kick off our conference with a keynote speech titled Democracy, Democratic Innovations and Representative Democracies. Uh, Mark Warren holds the Merleys Chair for the Study of Democracy at the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia. He's a researcher of democratic theory and citizen participation. Um, he also created and directs Participedia, which is the first ever 
international and collaborative knowledge database on participation across the world. So it is an honor for us to have Mark open this conference with us. Thank you very much, Mark, for being with us, with, with us today. And uh, the floor is yours. Okay, so does my screen look okay? Good, and unmuted? Yes, we can see. Good, good. Well, um, it's just such a, an honor to be able to uh, talk to everyone. Um, thanks so much for uh, Melissa. Thanks, uh, Gerhardt. Uh, and especially thank you, uh, Tammy and the uh, Latino team for uh, the brilliant project, which is uh, a, a brilliant foundation for this now crucial field of, of democratic in, uh, innovations. Now, uh, let me begin with a, an apology. Uh, I wrote this paper for a um, European audience, actually a German audience. Uh, and so it doesn't speak directly to the Latino project, but I hope it at least speaks indirectly as we uh, share hopes and fears for the democratic project. Um, <clears throat> now the fears are top of mind, uh, sharpened by the surges in authoritarian populism in many of the developed democracies. In contrast to earlier challenges, the threats to the democratic project are not so much other forms of government, but rather mismatches between the problems that people face and the capacities of representative democracies to address them. Uh, where the mismatch becomes a gulf, um, the competitive elections that uh, have been long associated with democratic government have become vehicles for authoritarian populists to undermine other equally necessary institutions including those associated with the rule of law and rights that define and empower democratic citizenship. Democracies may be eroding precisely through the electoral institutions that have come to define them. Now, if these are the fears, what are the hopes? First, it's important to uh, underscore the gains associated with the democratic project, lest the current challenges distract from its world historical accomplishments. Although the causalities are complex, uh, rankings of countries by the quality of democracy tends to be highly correlated with almost every measure of uh, social well being. Stronger democracies tend to be healthier, happier, more innovative, wealthier, more pluralistic and tolerant, better for women, women and minority, more attentive to the worst off, uh, as well as being less violent and less corrupt. Second, although demo the democratic project seems to be backsliding, in the developed democracies, we're not seeing a retreat from democratic values. Rather, we're seeing weaknesses of electoral democracy and the institutions that make electoral, electoral democracies work, including political parties. These weaknesses are no small matter. The democratic project can't survive without elections, voting, and the forms of representation and responsiveness they provide. But pathways to better, more stable, and more progressive democracies will involve supplementing our legacy institutions of electoral democracy with what we're now calling democratic innovations, processes that involve greater citizen participation, better representation, and higher quality deliberation. The democratic innovations that will make this future possible are, all, are already in the making. Uh, at the same time that electoral democracy seems to be weakening, we are seeing thousands of experiments with new and different ways of doing democracy. This said, these experiments are mostly relatively recent. And so it remains a challenge to, um, to innovate in the right ways uh, with the right kinds of capacities and the right kinds of incentive structures so they can fit into the places that they're most needed. Now in this talk, I'm hoping to place these challenges into context uh, with particular attention to how the field of democratic innovations needs to develop to meet these challenges. First, I'll say something about the structural drivers of the challenges. Second, I uh, note that democratic values are not in crisis, at least in the, the developed democracies. Uh, what we have is a democratic performance gap. Third, we need to think about democratic innovations systemically in terms of the opportunities that are developing within the representative democracies. Finally, if we can take up these challenges, we can refine an agenda for democratic innovations that will move the democratic project 
forward. Now, in the de developed democracies, signs that um, not uh, all is well have been there for some time as rates of voting have remained uh, stagnant in many countries and distrust in government remains stubbornly high. Populists and populist parties with authoritarian and anti-immigrant leanings have mobilized discontent. With enough success to gain power in the US, the UK, Germany, France, Italy, and many of the countries of Eastern Europe, uh, while uh, right populist parties have gained seats in the legislatures of virtually all of the Western European countries uh, and within states within federal systems and within the European Parliament. Uh, and then of course there's uh, Brazil and Bolsonaro. The drivers of these discontents are well known. Uh, foremost is the globalization of economies. Globalization has produced wealthier economies, but most of the gains have gone to those who are already wealthy uh, and to those who are educated in ways that are valued by knowledge economies. In the developed democracies, those without resources, skills, or education have found themselves competing with low-wage economies overseas. Nation states must choose between being left behind economically or allowing control of the economy to relocate into transnational and global trade agreements. From the standpoint of democracy, because nation states have less control over the structural forces of globalized economies, those elected to represent the people are likewise less powerful, which in turn decreases the powers of electoral democracy. Second, in most of the, of the developed democracies, um, <clears throat> inequality is now regionalized. Dynamic urban areas like San Francisco, London, or Frankfurt have tended to do well, while Rust Belt areas, think Oslo, I'm sorry, uh, Ohio, Yorkshire, uh, and much of the former Eastern uh, uh, Germany, uh, these areas have tended to stagnate. The electoral consequences are stark because representative democracies are mostly organized by territorial jurisdiction, geographic sorting of economies produces pockets of discontent that are easily mobilized by authoritarian populace. Third, cohort by cohort, citizens of developed democracies are becoming more post-material, more urban, more pluralized, and generally more tolerant and progressive over the last 40 years or so. When combined with democratic Graphic sorting, however, these trends have helped to generate a cultural backlash amongst older, wider, and less educated citizens. Fourth, while these trends are interacting with the rapid development of social media, uh, I'm sorry, these trends are, are interacting with the rapid development of social media and big data, uh, which makes it relatively easy for domestic political entrepreneurs and foreign mischief makers to organize, spread rumors and misinformation and to target voters with psychologically engineered appeals. The strategic incentives of competitive electoral systems tend to support and reward these kinds of tactics. Finally, uh, and of key importance is that support for democratic values in developed democracies is strong and growing. While older courts cohorts will tend to be more authoritarian. Uh, younger cohorts value active self-government. Authoritarian values are more pronounced in the more recent democracies like Hungary, Hungary and Poland, while they appear in the developed democracies primarily within older, wider demographics. Discontent with the performance of developed democracies and even widespread mistrust of political elites does not mean that there is broad support for authoritarianism, but rather that there is a widening gap between democratic ideals uh, of, of an increasing number of citizens and the performance of electoral democracies. So if there's a crisis of democracy, it's probably specific to election-based representative democracy, just because its key mechanisms are interacting badly with the trends of the last several decades. We cannot do without the feature with these, we cannot do without these features of democratic government, but we should be thinking about how to preserve their best effects. Accountability, representation by locale, uh, and nation states with capacities to do things <clears throat> while mitigating their worst effects. So democratic innovations need to be targeted to specific democratic deficits, 
focusing on inclusions of those who tend to be excluded from electoral politics, building representative bridges to decision makers, upgrading citizen knowledge and competence in reaching across borders. <clears throat> We're not starting from zero. These developments are already underway in most of the democracies. Despite current threats, uh, we may be at the beginnings of a quiet transformation of democracy, one possibly as revolutionary as the beginnings, as the um, <clears throat> development of the representative party-based democracy that evolved uh, out of the universal franchise. We're seeing hundreds of thousands of new channels of citizen involvement in government in most countries of the world. Excuse me. <clears throat> often outside of the more visible politics of electoral representation, often ad hoc, piecemeal, and segmented by policy, jurisdiction, and level of government, when viewed as a whole, these innovations suggest a transformation in the nature and structure of democratic governments, governance that may already be underway. <clears throat> <coughs> Apologies. <coughs> Going forward, we need to we need to match this current inventiveness with the opportunity structures evolving within and beyond the institutions of electoral democracy. We might think of these opportunities at three levels. <coughs> um, <coughs> those within electoral democracies. Uh, those below electoral democracy in decentralized and deconcentrated areas of governance and civil society, and those above electoral democracy between and beyond uh, nation state organizations. <clears throat> of course, to go to the first um, area here, electoral institutions will remain essential to the strong democracies. They continue to be the key organizers of state-based decisions <clears throat> and collective actions. They will continue to serve uh, key representative roles in larger, larger scale transnational in, 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 uh, international institutions, including those that must be reformed, extended, or invented to address globalizing problems and structures. For these representative roles to be democratically robust, democracy within states must become stronger and better. There are reforms of electoral systems themselves that would help to close represent, representation gaps, such as shifting to proportional representation in those countries, such as the UK, the US, and Canada, that still use single member plurality systems, uh, getting rid of gerrymandering in the US, of course, and continuing to support or uh, to, to target uh, voter suppression tactics. Uh, more ambitiously, voters should be better supported in their decisions with innovations that infuse elections with deliberative processes, uh, especially the kinds that make it more difficult for election strategists to manipulate voters. These might include longstanding suggestions like deliberation day uh, and new ways of deliberatively uh, connecting representatives and constituents. Uh, we also need to find ways of educating politicians about new forms of citizen representation through which politicians might learn to trust the people. The 2012 Irish Convention on the Constitution, the Citizens Assembly, uh, mixed in elected politicians with randomly chosen citizens. The politicians were sufficiently impressed with the deliberative qualities of the process that they supported Citizens Assemblies on abortion and marriage equality, which in turn led to uh, successful referendums. Beyond electing representative uh, democracies, I'm sorry, beyond electing representative bodies, the other place in which voting takes place, of course, is in ballot measures like referendums. Uh, there, there are many democratic problems with ballot measures or uh, what's often called direct democracy, including uh, manipulated agendas and citizen ignorance. Uh, but they're being used more and more uh, as politicians, especially populist politicians and citizens alike, uh, like these processes because of their apparent directness, uh, which um, seems to, to uh, bypass uh, so-called corrupt elites and special interests. 
Uh, so they're not going away. And we need to think about how to upgrade this kind of voting too, lest there be more Brexit-like misuses of direct democracy. One of the best recent innovations is uh, Oregon's uh, citizen initiative review process, which attaches a uh, randomly selected deliberative citizens jury to important or controversial ballot initiatives with the aim of encouraging broader public deliberation. Or referendums might be held in two stages, putting citizens on notice they should learn about an issue uh, before the second vote. Or more radically, referendums should be integrated into, might be integrated into normal legislative processes as they do in Switzerland with uh, what they call facultative referendums. These referendums enable citizens to challenge uh, legislation with the effect that elected politicians are much more attentive to representing citizens in their everyday um, legislative activities. The openings for democratic innovations are more promising within the bureaucratic parts of states, uh, what might be called governance-driven democratization. In many areas of policy governance, transportation, health, education, uh, region development, uh, urban planning, and so on, uh, the legitimacy from elections does not necessarily feed through <clears throat> into the mandates of agencies and ministries. So as the business of governance has become more complex, legislatures have tended to sketch directions and purposes and then hand off much of the politics to administrative rulemaking. These trends interact with another from the post-World War II era, era. When government agencies began to grow rapidly in their missions and reach, legislatures increasingly directed agencies and ministries to engage with affected publics as they write administrative rules. While such directives have often been uh, executed in ways that, are, uh, that minimally satisfy uh, legislative requirements, uh, in many places, agencies uh, have been more imaginative using a variety of innovative modes of engagement. Uh, Denmark's well-developed system of network governance, for example, brings citizens into to multiple points of decision. These trends uh, are likely to accelerate, providing uh, new opportunities for democratic upgrading of what are now uh, mostly uh, authoritarian bureaucracies. Complexity in governance has also been pushing more decisions below the peak institutions of representative democracy, often in ways that produce more opportunities for democratic innovations. Since the mid 1970s, uh, many responsibilities uh, have been decentralized to lower levels, levels of government through new federal, federal arrangements. Uh, for example, uh, Spain's and Italy's uh, autonomous regional governments. Uh, and uh, there's also been quite a bit of deconcentration, moving decisions to places that are closer to service delivery. Of course, there are dangers to democracy when public entities shift responsibilities to entities with unclear mandates and accountability. This said, these developments can and often do provide opportunities for democratic innovations. We're increasingly seeing municipal and regional governments engaging with citizens on local issues as they plan for transportation, waste disposal, social housing, schools and schooling, public health, uh, urban planning, and so on. Engaging with citizens is often driven by activism and advocacy, but it can also be driven by the professionalism of those involved in service delivery. Democratic innovation in municipalities can even be delivered, delivered uh, maybe shockingly, shockingly, by commitments to distributive justice, as was uh, argu arguably the case with um, <clears throat> uh, participatory budgeting uh, in Brazil under labor governments. Opportunities for democratic innovations above electoral democracy are more challenging owing to their scope and distance from most citizens. But because key structural drivers of democracy are global, we need to be especially attentive to these spaces of opportunity. So where should we look? First, we should pay close attention <clears throat> to the emergence of single issue governance regimes driven by governance needs that cross jurisdictions, such as transportation districts, security regimes, trade organizations, uh, issue specific international organizations, and so on. These opportunities can be driven by the need for international 
multinational <coughs> and transnational regimes to create their own legitimacy since they usually cannot borrow legitimacy from nation states. Second, similar kinds of opportunities have been emerging within established member state organizations. Formally, states should represent uh, their people within international organizations. But some organizations, uh, such as the UN, the World Bank, uh, and of course the European Union, also establish constituencies more directly, uh, particularly around issues closely related to human development and human rights in the areas of poverty, health, status of women, uh, labor standards, environmental issues, and refugees. Third, global civil society continues to grow and to develop, uh, often directly in response to global challenges. Cause-based civil society organizations establish and organize informal constituencies across jurisdictions. While most organizations uh, like these are not internally democratic, they do bring into existence structures and organizations kept, that can then be uh, democratized. Now to the final question. Um, looking forward, how should the field of democratic innovations develop so that it might uh, address these opportunities? There are at least seven areas that I think we need to build out. Uh, first, we need to recover and develop uh, a systems approach to democracy so that we uh, <clears throat> can develop context specific approaches to democratic deficits and target innovations uh, directly to them. Uh, in contrast to older systems approaches, we need to be quite purposeful uh, in constructing uh, normative uh, system fo focused questions that guide uh, both theory construction and empirics. Second, in order to track the forces that are affecting people's lives, we need to move beyond the statist conception, conceptual organization of much contemporary democratic theory and practice. We need to think about democracy generically as collective self-government, apart from jurisdictionally organized polities. In particular, we need to think about the people as constructed by those forces that affect their capacities for self-government. Uh, we might start with uh, what's now called the all-affected principle in democratic theory, the idea that if a collective matter uh, actual or potential affects people, they should have a say over these effects. Third, Deficit-driven demand for democratic innovations will depend in part on specific kinds of constitutional and electoral systems that are in deficit. The emerging field of democratic innovations needs to develop close partnerships with uh, so-called mainstream comparative work on democratic institutions to identify context-specific democratic deficits and opportunities and to develop supporting data. Excuse me again. Political science is now heavily weighted in favor of the study of voting, elections, and public opinion uh, because that's where the data is. In contrast, the field of democratic innovations is uh, currently still um, uh, data poor, especially the kind of data that supports um, high quality quantitative research. Uh, this circumstance is challenging. But in, but in part, uh, we're, we're progressing because of uh, important projects like the Latino project. As we develop data on democratic innovations, uh, it's uh, going to be easier to partner with mainstream comparatives. Fourth, to date, the field of democratic innovations has been strongest in response to problems that can be localized, problems like transportation, healthcare, and urban planning. The field hasn't focused on democratic deficits that result from the large scale structural drivers of problems, uh, especially global markets uh, with uh, structural inequalities, fiscal policy, policy, war and security, and immigration. That is the problems that are driving research and populisms, including its authoritarian variants. We've devoted far too little attention uh, <clears throat> to uh, how democratic innovations might interact with uh, those market-based drivers of social structures, the kinds that are not directly controlled by governments uh, or civil society organizations. Fifth, because most <clears throat> democratic organizations rightly, uh, have rightly focused on involving um, people more extensively and deeply in government and governance, 
we need to think about political divisions of labor so that they're um, the ultimately limited time of and energy and intelligence of citizens uh, is used to maximum, maximum effect. How and where uh, can more citizen participation add to and democratize political systems? When do we need professionals, both in politics and in mission specific agencies? And how can democratic innovations connect them to the values and knowledge that non-professionals can bring to decision-making and policies? Sixth, we need to understand elite motivations within existing uh, systems. Uh, if we're to figure out where democratic innovations uh, are going to be uh, uh, supported uh, and landing. Uh, the new field of democratic innovations not only needs to identify democratic deficits in the legacy institutions of representative democracy, but also to understand the kinds of problems that these deficits present for elected politicians uh, so that uh, we can uh, build elite coalitions uh, that will support democratic innovations. Finally, uh, we need to find ways of normatively evaluating system level consequences of democratic innovations. For example, does adding more points of citizen participation simply add more voice for those who already have political resources? Or can we design democratic innovations that generate more inclusions for those uh, who have been left out? Uh, can they help to produce better decisions that are better informed and more deliberative? Can they provide legitimacy gains that increase decision-making capacities, uh, including more trust in government, uh, or generate more citizen commitment for better distributions of public goods, protections, and social welf welfare? That is, can we assess the normative contributions of democratic innovations when they function as part, parts of broader political ecologies. So let me conclude by emphasizing the field of democratic innovations uh, needs to grow quickly and intelligently enough to backfill the, the uh, now uh, um, yawning deficits in the legacy institutions of representative democracy so that the, the democratic project might continue to develop and to beat back authoritarian challenges. Uh, the Latino project uh, is a, a really important part of this broader democratic project. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank you so much for this insightful pr presentation. I think it connects in so many ways to the work that we've been trying to do with Latino. And it's, it's really an honor for us to have you opening our conference today. 